Although the elections of 1988 are over with, it's very informative to go back and see what John Stockwell had to say about the elections while the campaign was still going on. He had about a year in the CIA. He, oh, yeah. I worked for him. But Bush would walk down the hall shaking hands. Uh, hello, I'm George Bush, and I want you to know I think this is a wonderful organization, <laughs> and I'm really happy to be here, and I really love working with people like you. What's your name, ma'am? You know? And uh, which just, it just didn't work. You know, he was campaigning right there in the halls. Now, like Gephardt at that point, he said, well, I'm against the Contras, and you'd ask about Angola, and he'd say, well, we'll have to study each part of the world. But Dukakis, his people just keep coming back and saying there will be no more Guatemala's and no more Chile. And then you say, well, what about the El Salvadorian uh, election manipulation campaign? Will those things be outlawed as well? And they say, there will be no more Chile's and no more Guatemala's. The information was out of this linkage with George Bush, his key staffers, with Felix Rodriguez down in Ilopango, who was running the Contra uh, air supply effort, which was, in fact, flying drugs back up into the United States. Even now, there's a possibility, if George Bush doesn't win the presidency, that he could wind up in jail. Because if he gets someone, if there's no Ed Meese in there protecting their agenda, uh, then, you know, if you put in a real attorney general who started encouraging the attorneys to pursue these things, uh, you bet you're going to wind up with some prosecutions. John Stockwell was in the CIA for 13 years, and one of his bosses was George Bush. More recently, he's spoken extensively with Dukakis people and the Jackson Organization. He shares his insights with us right now on Alternative Views. For 10 years now, John Stockwell has been a regular guest on Alternative Views. We first interviewed John in 1978 after he had quit the CIA and had just published a book, In Search of Enemies, in which he criticized the 1975 U.S. operation in Angola, which he supervised as CIA case officer. And he provided in this book his first general critique of the role of the CIA in U.S. foreign and domestic policy. In interviews with us over the last 10 years, John has discussed how he joined the CIA and provided detailed accounts of his operations in Angola, and Africa, and Vietnam, and elsewhere. In the meantime, John has become a peace activist, lecturer, author, screenwriter, and one of the world's foremost critics of the CIA and U.S. foreign policy. During the entirety of the 1980s, the Reagan years, John has been tireless in his criticism of the CIA and Reagan's foreign policy and has lectured and written and spoken out on these topics literally all over the world. So it is with great pleasure that we meet with John again today. John, we haven't seen you on Alternative Views for some time. What have you been up to this year? We've tried several times. I've been traveling constantly, nonstop travel. It finally wound down with well, the lecture stuff about the end of May, and then I took a, a vacation working on a book project down south and just got back into town. Lots of interest out there in the world, tremendous. I, I have invitations to lecture seven days a week, and I just sort of take what my voice will stand. Deep concern about Central America, deep concern about the arms race, deep concern about the drug problem that's, that's clearly dragging our nation down, uh, deep concern about the, you know, the truth of what our country's all about and, and the values that this country uh, professes. I mean, people have it laid out right in front of them that uh, our government is, has been tolerating and even encouraging drug traffickers in Central America. 
uh, one of the key drug traffickers in Panama, Noriega, it was published in Newsweek magazine saying openly, quote, the closing line in the Newsweek article for 10 million people to read, uh, Noriega saying, I've got the vice president by the balls. Now here you have a key drug mafioso openly bragging that he has blackmail control of, our, of one of the two presidential candidates now. This sort of thing has to have the nation uh, deeply concerned. The confusion redoubled, however, by Ronald Reagan going to Moscow and hugging and kissing with the evil empire, with Gorbachev, and, and, and Doonesbury writing a thing about the Cold War being, being dead, and the appearance of a ceasefire in Nicaragua. So on the one hand, you have people in the peace community saying, we won in Nicaragua, we stopped the, the destabilization there. Uh, President Reagan has been pressured and led and induced to uh, establish cordial relations with the Soviet Union, uh, and the Cold War is over, so the battle is won, which is as untrue and inaccurate as <laughs> some of the claims that the right was putting on us on, uh, on the other side. And again, one of the two presidential candidates deeply mired into the, the great drug machinery. Let's explore this theme for a minute, John. It hasn't really been reported on the media that George Bush, according to these stories at least, his office had a drug ring that was delivering arms to the countries and bringing back um, weapons or bringing back drugs into the United States, and that Bush's office was thus connected with uh, crime, with Noriega, with drugs, etc. Can you give a little bit of the detail of this operation and what this might portend for George Bush's future as a presidential candidate? Well, actually, the most fascinating thing is that it has been reported. A year and a half ago, when the Iran-Contra scandal broke, the major media was saying, time and again, George Bush is dead in the water. His political career is finished. I mean, the New York Times repeatedly, the Washington Post repeatedly, because the information was out of this linkage with George Bush his key staffers, with Felix Rodriguez down in Ilopango, who was running the Contra uh, air supply effort, which was, in fact, flying drugs back up into the United States. Felix Rodriguez was the man who approached uh, the Medellin Colombian cocaine cartel to get them to make a donation to the Contras during the Boland hiatus to buy continuing access to the airplanes. This information was in the major, major media a year and a half ago. But the, the tolerance of this nation, conditioned to the sleaze and corruption and lies and, and, and intolerable, what should be outrageous activities of uh, Oliver North, of the National Security Council, in blowing off the law, illegally smuggling drugs, illegally exporting arms, illegally running wars around the world, illegally uh, trying to assassinate world leaders, bragging about it on one hand and turning around the next day and denying it, the nation has just become so incredibly tolerant that, that they didn't close Bush down a year and a half ago, and he has managed, since he had control of the Re Republican Party machine, and he's the heir apparent as vice president, he's managed to proceed and emerge as one of the two presidential candidates now. If Dukakis stubs his toe, Bush will be the president with uh, the leading drug dealers bragging, quote Newsweek, uh, we've got him by the balls. They own him. You know, there was a quote or a story in the spotlight which just came out today, and it was talking about they have some information about uh, the, some intercepts which the National Security Agency has, which they've been sitting on for some time, in which they have Noriega talking to people and Noriega talking specifically about his relationship with Bush mm -hmm. and, and all and how this tied in with the drugs. And the guy is just, uh, he, he, see, he didn't call him a wimp, he called him a pimp. And the person <laughs> on the other line said, you mean a wimp? No, I know English, I said pimp. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the it, the, I think the, the, the key thing that I saw that somebody pointed out, some analyst said, if the U.S. media were spending as much time on George Bush, as they do on the sex lives of Tammy Baker and some of the other right-wing evangelists, then the people would have a very clear idea about George Bush. And his or if they'd activities. spent the amount of time on, on George Bush that they spent on Gary Hart's sex life, for right. example. Mm -hmm. But they were clearly out to destroy Gary Hart, and they did 
over a matter of, of sexual promiscuity, which is not that unusual in Washington, believe me, amongst senators and congressmen and, and, and the world of society today. Uh, the drug smuggling, unfortunately, see the tolerance of the nation gets uh, back, it's understandable at two levels. You would think that the man, the doors would slam shut on him everywhere. You would think that based on what we know right up front in the public record that he would have been impeached and forced to resign immediately. Discussions were held about this a year and a half ago that, that made it into the public realm, oh. but he didn't. The reason the nation is not outraged as it should be, as I see it, is because at both ends of the spectrum and in between, there's a tolerance towards drugs and ambivalence. Uh, on the bottom end, drugs have been counterculture stuff for a long time. The progressive community, the hippies, the, you know, the, as an act of defiant smoking pot. In between, you have doctors and, and lawyers and business people and, and uh, the engineers in Silicon Valley as the ones who can afford cocaine when the price was higher. Now there's been so much cocaine into the country plus crack that the price is down. Then at the ultra end of the spectrum, you're talking about $150 billion industry. Now there's no way that our major banks are gonna allow this money to be deposited in banks on Mars or in the Soviet Union. This is big business. And so they're gonna be sucking the money back into the machine as efficiently as possible, which they do through these Cayman Island banks. And Panama. And Panama. And clearly. San Antonio. And San Antonio and Miami. Right. And the money flows. So the question is, where is society going to go? The, the, the capitalists, the people who own the banks, who own the capital system, uh, obviously are comfortable with George Bush. The machinery, the wheels would turn. They make their money. It gets, it gets fascinating taking it to the other end of the line, the third world's revenge, if you will. Looking at it from the viewpoint of, of Latin Americans, as long as the stuff is exported up here, it's a source of hard currency. It's mo a lot better than selling bananas, a lot more profitable to the United States, bringing hard currency down to their country. And if, in fact, it damages the U.S. society, there's not a great percentage of people in Latin America who would be regretful, considering the way we've exploited Latin America all of these years. Getting back to George Bush is a very important connection, and that is, those of us who study American power structure, I've been following this, and that is that George Bush was the establishment, David Rockefeller, et cetera. They, he was their candidate during the election when Reagan came in, and they forced Bush upon Reagan. Reagan didn't want him. Now they found out, uh, of course, uh, Bush was a member of the Trilateral Commission, and then when the right-wingers put heat on him during the election, or the, the attempt to get the nomination, well, then George Bush quit. So, well, I'm not a member of the Trilateral Commission anymore. But since then, the Trilateral Commission and the Bilderberg Organization, which is even a more covert organization of the international power structure, but once again controlled by David Rockefeller, they reiterated just the past few days that Bush is their candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, they also have people who are from the establishment media and they all claim that there's no such organization as the Bilderberg. But particularly the right-wingers, they penetrate these organizations to find out what's going on. So this is one of the main things they have uh, going for them now. They put out the word they're going to support George Bush right down the line because they're not sure about Dukakis. They don't, he's an unknown quantity. But, so this, you know, if, if these groups control the media, this means that at least as far as CBS and the television networks are concerned, this story about Bush and his connection with these drug rings simply might not penetrate in, into the uh, public. I mean, even if the New York Times or Washington Post has a story on page 10, unless it gets on the cover of Newsweek and Time and onto the front of the CBS News and is repeated 10 days in a row, the story doesn't have any effect. That's right. We, rem we have to remember that Watergate was talked about before Nixon won the his, his election. last election, you bet. Absolutely. it was talked about, but it wasn't until after he won the election that the media really got in there and started digging and plastered it every day, and that's that's what's needed. Pounded in into people's mm -hmm. consciousness, and this yeah. this is the big question: is will now Dukakis is leading uh, 51 to 39 over Bush, according to what I saw on TV yesterday, and and among women voters it's 61 to 39 or something like that. The the uh, 
The question, of course, is what's going to happen after the conventions when they go after each other, after they've resolved the party issues. And I, I would think that, uh, that we will see uh, some of the layers being peeled off in that debate. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, because if you understand that we have a two-party system, but it's two parts of the same system, mm -hmm. and, and like the Iran-Contra cover-up last summer, the, the purpose of that was a bipartisan, uh, a, a apparent bipartisan function to, to, to maintain the public trust. Damage control. Damage control, in which the Democrats allowed the Republicans to advance their agenda, and the Democrats did not go for the juggler vein, which would have been easy to do to right. impeach George Bush and President Reagan, because the system didn't want to lo lose the public trust. It is, it is very possible that right. Dukakis will not go for George Bush's throat, even at the, at the potential cost of losing the election. Well, if he's ahead enough in the polls, as he is now, he doesn't need to. He has plenty of other issues that he can exploit. For one thing, Bush doesn't have any real social base. It's only the Republican country club set and multinational capital set that are really behind him. Otherwise, the, even the right wing in this country has grave suspicions about Bush. They see him as a Connecticut, you know, East Coast sort of Republican moderate, which they don't like. Absolutely. So, so this is not a popular uh, candidate. He's had very little success in his speaking and campaigning in terms of mobilizing support the way Ronald Reagan was able to. Then you get into the question of where, where would Dukakis lead us mm -hmm. if, he, if he does. If Bush comes in, he's continuing Reaganomics. Mm -hmm. And he's continuing covert action in the secret wars, and he's trying to play the macho, the echo of Ronald Reagan. This is a little ironic and unfortunate when you, when you consider that, as has, was noted many times, Ronald Reagan, you know, it was said, never had an original idea in his life. <laughs> and George Bush is coming along trying to echo Ronald Reagan's ideas such as they were. It puts George Bush pretty far down the ladder in terms of innovation and thinking, <laughs> development of programs and policies. But uh, let's take it to the other side. Say things go as they seem to be going and Dukakis wins. Where will that put the world? Uh, and it puts, it puts the world into a, a, a situation that has me deeply concerned. One of the advantages when Reagan was in office is the simplistic idealism, uh, uh, outspoken misspeaking, upfront corruption, sleaze, turning on the spigots, spending the money, uh, it was an overt evil, if you will, an overt mismanagement, an overt corruption, an overt brutality. Uh, what, what we're facing now is a situation where the, the peace movement, the people are being lulled. If you will, Reagan in his last year has turned smart. Nancy and her astrologer or someone, you know, if they've got it worked out. Uh, by hugging and kissing with Gorbachev and coming up with an INF token agreement, they've got everyone breathing a sigh of relief. And well, you have to say it is better to have them talking than to have them railing at each other and threatening. However, before the INF, now the INF agreement provides for us to withdraw, what is it, 432 missiles from Europe and the Russians to take out a bunch of obsolete SS-20s, 1600 or something like that. Now, the, the, before this agreement was inked, the, the nuclear gang was making its arguments, preparing uh, to build and deploy 2,000 more, more sophisticated weapons in Europe, claiming that we were weakened because of the INF agreement. So what we're facing is a quantum leap forward in, in, the, in the nuclear, you know, rush to nuclear midnight. And the peace movement lulled into quiet by, well, we have an agreement and the le leaders are hugging and kissing. Even if they take another step forward and go for the reduction of s some of the strategic missiles, it's only to clear the deck so that they can get money to build some more. They're also saying that the new generation, like you said, they, they, were, they were in a real panic when the, all this came about and the Russians kept giving us more and more, giving us, giving the Americans mm -hmm. more and more, until finally we couldn't refuse yeah. because we looked really, really bad. So immediately Kissinger and all those people had a big powwow and they came up and said, well, you know, we need not only a new generation, but we need all kinds of, of uh, mm -hmm. conventional weapons to uh, defend the communist threat. And these are going to cost a whole lot more, folks, so that means you know, blah, 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 blah. 
The question is whether Dukakis would go along with these kinds of policies. Jesse Jackson, of course, has been criticizing his domestic policies as simply amounting to a managing of Reaganomics. Right. In other words, not carrying out fundamental economic changes. And there's no evidence so far that Dukakis does have another economic uh, program other than manage technocratic management, tightening the belt, trying to work on the deficit a little bit. Uh, now, there are a lot of parallels between what, if you read the book, uh, Dukakis, The Man Who Would Be President, mm -hmm. which is, which is uh, self-serve, I mean, it's, it's a, an advocacy book, but, but still laying out his, his mistakes in his career. It's what he's done in Massachusetts. It, you know, he, was, he was swearing he would never raise taxes. He was forced to. The state was going bankrupt but uh, cutting substantially social programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the economic revival in Massachusetts and Boston, which is pretty real, a lot of that's built on defense spending. Right. Ronald Reagan now, made it possible with his military buildup. Yes, exactly. Managing, uh, managing Reaganomics and profiting from it. Uh, and ironic. Then, then you get into, you know, supposedly uh, liberalism or progressive. You find little things that have to trouble you know how far he'll go with them i don't know but uh a big political effort early in his career brookline you know this this elite uh residential area that he grew up in and lives in uh was being invaded by you know the the the, the, the cruddy people who, who weren't wealthy who weren't plugged in now dukakis himself wasn't wealthy but still he cherished this exclusive area that he lived in so he was working very hard to keep the the scumbags out keep the riffraff out, see. And uh, this, of course, is the principle of immigrants from the beginning of the United States. Once they get in, and right. the second generation, they, they graduate from Harvard, they want to keep the others out. Now, what are his policies going to be for the immigrants, the INS, you know, the, all of these things that, that Reagan has been very upfront about? I think we may be in for some, some uh, unfortunate surprises from Dukakis on these issues. Well, and not <clears throat> now that he won't be pushed by Jesse Jackson, He'll go back to his usual self, I think. After he had the nomination sewed up, I saw where he was saying, uh, well, actually, in a lot of ways, I'm more conservative than George Bush. And then I read some analyses of his years in Massachusetts in The Guardian, and they were saying a lot of these same things that you were saying, that he was uh, anti-labor, anti-gay, he was cutting social services, and he was making sure that there weren't any taxes on the corporations or the wealthy. He was just a mini Reagan in uh, Massachusetts. The flip side of the system, you know, that's the, the twiddly dum and twiddly d. Uh, twiddly he will dumb have twiddly dumber. <laughs> <laughs> he will have uh, the the added uh, or, or, or the asset of uh, he has been fierce on corruption. Mm -hmm. His whole political. He'll career. be a good, honest manager. A squeaky clean. He's he has been fighting corruption. He did work very hard, uh, and and gets a lot of credit for cleaning up a very rotten political machine in Massachusetts and Boston. And and this uh, this of course the the nation would respond to this and welcome this. Would he come out real hard on the drug smuggling and as he as he said on occasion, indict all the people involved? Eh. I, I'm skeptical. Would he rock the boat that much? I, I don't see anything in his past that, that didn't If you really it. get to the bottom of it, I mean, you've got to clear away the big banks and the Rockefellers, and nobody's going to do that. Most in, yes, the most interesting thing that's going to come out of the next month will be at the Democratic Convention will be to see uh, how they deal with Jesse Jackson and this large constituency that he brings in there by all rights. Uh, he should be the vice president. If there were any any popular responsibility or democracy in this two-party system we have, he has earned the right at least to the vice presidency. But if he's if he comes into the vice presidency, of course, he'll bring his progressive agenda. And there'll be and, a lot of clashes in the and White House. Be they don't see the establishment can live very well with Dukakis. Mm -hmm. They're going to have big problems living with Jackson, even if he's compromising and trying to you know calm them and reassure them. Uh, what they will probably do, of course, is get a conservative running mate. And then it'll be interesting to see what they can give Jackson that will keep him on board. Right. Because if they betray him, if they cut him off, if they humiliate him, then all of the 30%, the whatever it is that, you know, that has, has supported him solidly, uh, they're not going to vote for Dukakis and his team, in which case George Bush 
could wind up to be president. So they need Jackson to win, but they can't concede a lot of uh, the ideas he wants because it goes against the grain of their own uh, ideologies. The, the basic ideology of capitalist control of the system, the power mm -hmm. block controlling itself, Jackson is the challenge. There's another curiosity about Dukakis, and that is he came out very strongly about doing away with the U.S. foreign policy in regard to Nicaragua. He it's a failed policy, no good, we've got to quit supporting the Contras. Yet on the other hand, he said that he would not abandon first strike in a nuclear war. So it seems like it's kind of a contradiction here. I was so surprised to see him come out so strongly against the Contras. Well, Dukakis, uh, mind you, this association we've put together, we've, had, we've been going to primary states and holding hearings and challenging the candidates. Okay, what, what is your association? You're it's, we call it the Association for Responsible Dissent, and it's built around some ex-CIA, some ex-Defense Department, ex-State, ex-National Security Council, as well as civilian scholars who are, who are qualified scholars into the subject and people who've earned credentials in other ways through writing or filmmaking or whatnot to be uh, qualified as experts on the subject of national security, to investigate it, to study, to educate, research. And um, it, tremendous energy in this thing. This is the organization that has finally brought together, uh, uh, given a home uh, in which people like uh, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Dale Scott, David McMichael, Brian Wilson. John Stockwell. John Stockwell, yeah, the first organization I've joined since I left the government. Uh, there just wasn't a, an organization that related to our interests, and yet our interests are basic to the whole uh, diseased aspect of our potentially wonderful system. And this, this group has been meeting continuously. We've had 10 major meetings during the year wherever we could wow. At, at, in states where primaries were being held, challenging the candidates to come. Now, they're in and out of town, very hard to nail them down, but if they couldn't come to send someone to articulate their positions and answer questions and challenges from us. And uh, what we got out of Dukakis, it was useful. We, we did make them articulate positions on quote, national security and covert policies and secrecy and whatnot. Well, you met with Dukakis or some of his well, Some of us met with Dukakis, and we had formal public hearings oh. in which he sent key aides to articulate his line. Oh, what is And uh, Simon, Jackson, the others, I mean, we were doing this way back in Iowa and since. Uh, what Dukakis said, we dropped the others because okay. they're, they're out of it. Although at one point last January, some of Jackson's advisors we're beginning to say, well, a little bit of covert action. And we got, oh yeah, and we, we, got, we nailed them. We stopped that by saying, you know, you can't have a little bit of that. You know, if, if Jackson, and they were saying, well, we need a more moderate image to, so we don't scare people off. And we said, we won't put up with that. If Jesse Jackson moderates and compromises on his sympathy and protective position towards the third world, uh, then he will be absolutely chopped off by the progressive community in the world. He will not be allowed to compromise. And they very quickly dropped that line. Now, what Dukakis said was, was actually, you know, a plus on his side, I would say, encouraging. He was in Peru, you know, he speaks excellent Spanish. Right, right. He was in Peru as a young man working when the Guatemalan operation was run. As he has said himself in public speeches, he personally felt the humiliation of seeing his country engineer the overthrow of a functioning constitutional democracy in Latin America for, for the profit of the United Fruit Company. And this was 1953, 1954? Exactly, 54. And he, right. he said repeatedly, and his staffers maintain, that if he's elected president, there will be no more Chiles and Guatemalas, as he puts it. So then you tell him, you know, okay, what about Angola? What about Chad? What about Ethiopia? Will he cut out all covert actions? And what they do, um, now at Gephardt at that point, he said, well, I'm against the Contras, and you'd ask about Angola, and he'd say, well, we'll have to study each part of the world. But Dukakis, his people just keep coming back and saying there will be no more Guatemalas and no more Chile. And then you say, well, what about the El Salvadorian uh, election manipulation campaign? Will those things be outlawed as well? And they say there will be no more Chiles and no more Guatemalas. Now, this is encouraging. Now, if you add that to, if you will, the results of our efforts uh, over, over the years, yours, alternative views, mine, lecturing, uh, and the community at large, 
uh, we've accomplished some interesting things. Bill Colby, my old boss, who ran the Phoenix program in Vietnam, that he says killed 22,000 people, has come out saying that the CIA should be gotten out of the corporate action business altogether. What? Colby? Yes. Colby? He was the head of the CIA, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. CIA director. Right. Yeah, he's been... That's, well, what, what, cha what changed that? Because I, I've seen him on TV or, you know, the he's past few years. He's not saying the U.S. shouldn't do these things. He's, he's saying that the CIA should be gotten out. It should out be an intelligence him. agency yeah. rather than an action agency. Yeah, William Webster, who's the new director, who's saying he hasn't said, this is my policy, this is what I'm working towards. Mm -hmm. But he said... That, the, that we should examine the possibility of getting the CIA out of covert action altogether. Well, then where they're not saying there wouldn't be covert action. They're saying get the CIA out? Is that what they're They just sort of they stopped, afraid? They stopped their comment at that point. Now, the, the presumption, of course, is that, that the stuff would be done by the Defense Department <laughs> and the Green Berets, <laughs> yeah. and they would do the covert wars, and the CIA would gather intelligence. Now, uh, this would, in fact, be a healthy step for the nation. For one thing, we might have a chance of getting some good intelligence <laughs> if the CIA wasn't having to justify its own wars. Of course, the danger would be uh, the, uh, transferring to the Pentagon generals in charge and having them out there trying to overthrow gr governments and whatnot. If that happens, now if Dukakis came into office and pursued his policy about Guatemala's and Chile's, and if Webster would play ball, and the community, mind you, the block of CI pros inside, who would like to go home and feel proud in front of their 20-year-old college daughters, who've mm -hmm. just seen a film about Contra slitting throats, you know, in Nicaragua, and, and, you know, Daddy, are you in the CIA, you know? I mean, this is a real problem for CIA officers. There is a block of people inside the CIA, and there has been all along, that have been saying, we would like to be an honorable organization. We've been betrayed by people who want to go out and pay people to cut throats. We should gather intelligence and do it well. Now, if events evolve, and that's a big if, if George Bush comes in, just forget all, all of right. this, and if Dukakis comes in, put a big question mark on it, but if it did evolve in this direction, then we would run into a restructuring and a lot of uh, political infighting. Would the CIA really give up all capability, or would they just give up most of it but retain a little unit that would do some things? Uh, and then if you got it into the, the Pentagon, uh, they don't have stations in every embassy around the world. This is how the CIA has managed to hang on to this capability. The other people don't have the way to send telegrams, the infrastructure. Uh, people train people speaking languages to do this all over the world. So what you would see would be a re restructuring of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, with it being built up, at least in key countries, that they wanted to destabilize around the world, and see a shifting of these activities from one department to another, with perhaps the CIA winding up a different kind of an organization. But the big question is, would, you know, would in fact the United States policy change one iota? And my suggestion is that that, uh, that like this INF agreement, we, we have not stopped, we're still, you know, cranking out five uh, bombs a day. And, and the Soviet Union is, you know, you know, putting out bombs and more sophisticated ones all the time, plus all these other nations that are trying to reach some level of parity in the MAD principle. Mutually by, assured destruction. Exactly. By 1992, the British and the French can combined uh, or, or it's estimated, and this is not solid figures that we've been able to document, but about uh, uh, 1,200 uh, deliverable uh, ther strategic thermonuclear weapons between them. Well, see, that's enough to destroy the world, either one of them. And so that would put them into the MAD category. They could destroy us as we could destroy them. The French could destroy us as we could destroy them. So other nations coming into the level of the club the inner membership, the upper membership, where they could also destroy the world, or trigger events that would destroy the world. Now, while we're celebrating the INF agreement, the factories are turning out these, these weapons of destruction at the same pace they have throughout. So the peace movement should remain vigilant and active. 
We have to redouble our efforts, and it's going to be, it is harder, and it's going to be harder. Was Reagan and Gorbachev it was hugging not the sense of alarm or mm -hmm. imminent uh, danger that sure, we had. Sure, it was much Reagan easier years. when President Reagan was, was railing at the evil empire and saying, you can always drop some test bombs in Europe to show them we mean business. <laughs> I mean, that's up front. I mean, you, you would want in the peace movement to have a president that was that gauche just because it makes your case so easy to make. Uh, I, I've been on TV shows and radio shows, including one yesterday, in which uh, someone was railing at me over the air saying, you know, I was way out of touch, you know, they've got an agreement going, and why was I a diehard and everything? And yet nothing has changed. They're going to pull back 432 weapons from Europe. Now, this person was saying, see, you've got to get tough. We have to have an asset with the Soviets before we can bargain. Now, we had 30,000 thermonuclear weapons before Reagan came into office. You know, we had a major asset. We had enough to destroy 50 or 60 Soviet <laughs> unions altogether. Uh, he came up with this program that Admiral Arak published and gave the budgetary figures for and everything, began before he came into office, and he pursued it and sold it and made it effective to build and deploy 17,000 more thermonuclear weapons. He put the 400 uh, Pershings and intermediate weapons in Europe, and then we come up with the program, to, to, to the INF agreement, to, to, to dismantle the delivery systems and take the bombs back home. And the Soviets, as part of the agreement, pull out tw uh, their SS-20s, which were obsolete anyway, which they don't need. They can, with their longer-range missiles, devastate Europe very easily and very effectively. But the quantum increase, the gross increase, for the world, of course, is, is uh, what if we got a 30-some-odd percentage increase in our thermonuclear capability under Ronald Reagan? And the Soviets, likewise, plus these other nations coming on board. And, and they Go ahead. Now, well, the point is that they're claiming, see, this is a vindication of what Reagan said when he came into office. He said, you have to get tough, build up your military to get the Russians to talk. So I got tough, I built up the military, and I got them to sign an agreement. The first agreement that's ever been made that where they, we really dismantled weapons. But the fact is, what is, it, what is 400 out of, out of 40,000? You know, is 1%? It's, I mean, they're, they're getting rid of a tiny little percentage of, of weapons that didn't exist when they came into office. And it's an utter fraud. they've a hundred times more than that. It's an utter fraud. To get them to go back and reduce a tiny percentage of them. Of obsolete weapons. Meanwhile, the Russians are coming out with their SS-18s and their merv SS-18s and the, and the other evolutions of weaponry. Which, which clearly uh, make the world uh, uh, exponentially more dangerous at the end of the Reagan era, despite this INF agreement. How do you and as Daniel Ellsberg said back when Jimmy Carter was in office, we have a tape of a speech he gave here. Of course, he was a former uh, defense analyst himself at the Rand Corporation. He said, if you want a deterrent, you only need two submarines. Yes. Because uh -huh. yes. each of them can wipe out the major cities in the Soviet Union. Exactly. John, to um, go back to Dukakis, what is his uh, policy on nuclear weapons and relations with the Soviet uh, Union? There hadn't been too much on that in the media. Well, uh, he, he's been faulted for making some, some fairly uh, basic statements uh, uh, at the level of, of first strike capability and bargaining mm -hmm. with the Soviets, which which, which were, in fact, naive, which were, in, in fact, simplistic, and gave ammunition to the other side that he has no experience in this field. Um, he, he's saying, basically, that we have to pursue vigorously an arms agreement and get rid of 50% of the, of the strategic weapons. And it, it, is, it is awkward because that, I mean, that's wonderful. 50% is half the, the number that could malfunction right. and trigger World War. Uh, three and the obliteration of the, of the planet, but it still leaves enough to utterly destroy ten planets. Meanwhile, the factories are still... It gets back to the Jonathan Shell book, The Fate of the Earth. You know, you can get rid of all the weapons, but you've still got the factories turning out weapons. You get rid of the... You close down the factories, but you've still got the technical capability. So, you know, that would be a wonderful first step, but it would be meaningless unless we shut the factories down. Well, what about military, testing. military spending on uh, weapons development with Dukakis? Has he committed himself to significant restraints in this area? 
or is he just not taking a clear position yet? I have seen no commitment from him on uh, on cutting back on uh, on the on the on the defense, and, and no reassurance, and no implied reassurance. You try to strip strip away the rhetoric and the right. glib things that they all say. I'm for peace, you right. know. And uh, uh, no, this he is not beating the drums of a of a big defense. Uh, program, but if you look what, at what he did in Massachusetts, uh, cutting cutting welfare, cutting the social program, selling out the progressive community, if you will, in the interests of the people, for the the capitalist system, for the economic good, uh, it does not give you any great assurance that he's going to go after the military machine. He probably will go after corruption. Now, one thing that he, it was just, you know, yesterday in the news is Bush was, uh, was bashing him on tax increases and Dukakis was saying that he would solve the tax problem by really vigorous laws uh, to recover taxes that are not being paid. As opposed to cutting back military spending that could solve the national deficit in yeah. two years if they just stopped producing weapons. Yeah, cutting back on the military spending and also going after the, the rich, the higher income right. brackets that don't pay. As opposed don't to Scott Laws who are he, holding he's out He's going to be going after, you know, the great, you know, right. the people across the nation who, who are, are a little loose on paying this and paying that. And, uh, and try to launch a, a reform at that level without doing anything. At least that, that's the indication. We don't know for sure, but right. that's the indication I see. That's what I'm concerned. John, can I ask you a, 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 another question about George Bush? Uh, to a lot of people, he's just kind of a mealy-mouthed you know, wimp. He doesn't seem to have much substance to him. Well, he was head of the CIA. How long was he head of the CIA, and did he have any personal impact on it? And did the CIA change direction in any way when he was head of it? Yeah, he had uh, he had about a year in the CIA. He, year. I worked for him. He, mm -hmm. you know, you know, in the Angolan operation, President Ford fired Bill Colby in November, and then suddenly realized that we were still in the process of the the Senate hearings. And Colby was right in, the, you couldn't change directors in the middle of the hearings, and we were in the middle of the Angola War. And the Congress was very upset about this war. And so he, he announced, without consulting uh, Colby, they released it to the paper that he had been fired. And then, that was on a Friday, on a Monday, they had to go back and ask him if he would stick around for another couple of months. <laughs> and only a good soldier of his caliber uh, would have agreed. Anyone else in the world would have said, sorry, babe, you know, I just read in the paper I was fired and enough is enough. But he agreed and he stuck it out and he took the heat. And then when the program was stopped by the Congress, the Tunney Amendment passed on the 18th of December in 75, and then we got into, it took, you know, six weeks for them to sign it into law. They brought George Bush in and he inherited the job of fending off the hostile Congress. And this was where I worked for him. Now, I was not in his office. I didn't work close with him, but nevertheless, he was the director, and we had a real rotten apple in this Angola thing because we had lied to the Congress. We committed perjury. <laughs> we had broken the law. And the Congress was very angry, and they had the ammunition not to, to shut us down and to, and to jail us, certainly. Uh, it, it had all of the potential dimensions of the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, and, and his job... The Congress didn't want another Watergate-sized scandal, and so they, if, they, if they could be persuaded, they would, and he inherited the job. Anyway, what we found was first he came in office, and uh, it led to a lot of joking because of this factor, the wimp factor, that, uh, this superficiality, uh, the phoniness of the man. He, he was, uh, from the first day he got there, he put out a memo saying, you know, how wonderful it was to be on board this wonderful organization with all these wonderful people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then every three days we would get another memo would go throughout the entire building telling us how wonderful we were. And, you know, these sophisticated people, this is, this is childish. It's, it's uh, campaign rhetoric kind of stuff. Uh, he would also, we, we, in, in the CIA, I mean, these people, you know, they go up and down, they run errands, they go to meetings, across the directors. And you'd find yourself sometime on the elevator with the director or down in the gym with the director. And kind of, you know, this was M, and they had their space, and you sort of, you know, stood to your side of the elevator and kept your mouth shut. But Bush would walk down the hall 
shaking hands. Uh, hello, I'm George Bush, and I want you to know I think this is a wonderful organization, <laughs> and I'm really happy to be here, and I really love working with people like you. What's your name, ma'am? You know, and, and uh, which just it just didn't work. You know, he was campaigning right there in the halls. Uh, it didn't work to gain anyone's respect. One thing that came out of it, apparently, and reconstructing all of the details will, will never be done. History will never give us this unless someone involved writes a good book, and I don't think they will in this case. But it was during his tenure that there was the bombing in, in uh, Washington Circle in, in Washington of, of Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffitt by uh, some, some CI people from the Operation Mongoose, the uh, Pro Project 40, destabilization of Cuba. And these people, people who, were Chileans who had been with the Allende government. Chileans, but also Cuban exiles. Who, right, who were in ex exile. It was, the operation was run by the Chileans, mm -hmm. Dina, but uh, people who were actually involved were from this Cuban exile community. Right. Now this was the community that had worked for about four intense years under Kennedy and then Johnson and then Johnson shut it down right. to destabilize uh, Fidel's Cuba in the early days of the revolution. And then Johnson cut it off. Now when Johnson, and it was bloody, it was a big one. Cronkite did a show on it, Dan Rather did a show on it years later. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was hundreds and hundreds of sorties and boat raids flown and you know, burning crops swine fever in the hog population, bombs in department stores, white phosphorus grenades in schools, kidnapping and murder. It was a really vicious thing. Now, blowing up airplanes. Blowing up airplanes, absolutely. Now, when these people were cut off by the CIA under Johnson, under his orders, uh, they, they were set free with all their skills, but also with the tolerance of the entire Florida legal structure. Who had, who had been warned off all these years, well, this is CIA national security. You let that boat of arms go through. And of course, those boats of arms began to go and come with drugs. So when they were cut off, they had the skills, the training, the violence, and the license, and they immediately became a big mafia uh, in Florida and went into murdering and bombing and killing. And, and then taking it up to New York, bombing and bombing, trying to bomb the Cuban mission, trying to bomb the United Nations, uh, lots of bombings and killings. This Orlando Bosch who just came back into the country had been caught trying to fire a bazooka at a Polish freighter. Uh, they had task force set up to study this crime problem of the Cuban exiles and concluding that it was virtually unsolvable. During Bush's tenure, the CIA cut a deal with these people saying enough is enough for political, you simply have to get out of the country to keep this and cool it inside the United States. And they went out of the country in September of 76 and had this meeting in the Bahamas where they formed this Kourou organization, which one month later in October blew up the Cubana airliner. Right. It was taking off from Barbados that had the, the fencing team in Santiago, Santiago Alvarez uh, wife and child, a filmmaker's wife and child on it, and 76 other people. Now, this deal, the contacts that were made uh, uh, w with Bush, with these people at that time, uh, re reappear when he has Don Gregg on his staff as vice president, with Felix Rodriguez, who was a ranking member of that Cuban community, who was with Don Gregg in Vietnam. And then you have Chichi Quintero and the others working with, with Rodriguez in the Contra program. And George Bush's son down in, in, uh, in Florida going on television literally arm in arm in December of 85, literally arm in arm with 10 uh, uh, exes from this Cuban exile destabilization of Cuba program. So this apparently is where jo George Bush, the effete Ivy Leaguer, got plugged into that mafia mm -hmm. and they got their hooks into him, made the contacts that, that led eventually the situation where today uh, one of them, Noriega, is able to say, I have George Bush by the balls. See, this now, is, mind yeah. you, mind you, the CIA had Noriega on, on its payroll, 200,000 a year back when he was G2 of the Army. And Omar Torrejos died in a mysterious plane crash and Noriega becomes the leader of the country. My guess we do not have this confirmed. We do have it confirmed that the CIA had him on the payroll. Now, my guess is that at that time, if it was not plotted by the CIA, 
are plotted by Noriega himself, killing Torreos so Noriega could take power. However that happened in detail, some CIA case officers were riding very high in their little office of the CIA because their agent was now in charge of Panama. What evolved past that, though, of course, is Noriega has a personality of his own, and eventually he's dealing with the Colombians, and he's dealing with Cuba, and he's dealing with Israel, and everybody else, and eventually began to break the, break the, the CIA's rules and others' rules until, the, until eventually they, they turned on him to indict him. He was selling too many drugs on his own. Well, the selling of the drugs, that's been done by people working for the CIA since World War II. The Kunmin OSS station in China was actually paying its bills with heroin. And then the, the, the Kuomintang, the, the, the Chinats, all those planes that were flying into Tibet and Burma and back into Taiwan, that was part, that was a subsidy of the Taiwanese economy. That was part of why Taiwan flourished. A lot of U.S. aid, a lot of ingenuity on their part in building factories and whatnot, and a steady influx of, of big uh, uh, heroin drug money with the CIA's Air American, before that the Civil Air Transport, flying the stuff for them. Are the truth going to come out on this issue? Is there going to be more focus on it? Or is this just going to disappear like Watergate? We still don't know what happened in Watergate. Many no, I, I think absolutely. The Iran Contra cover-up mm -hmm. of last summer, this mm -hmm. is the proper title. It's okay. not the Iran Contra co Joint Committees of the Congress. It's the, the cover Iran Contra cover-up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they, they, they had a damage control problem. Mm -hmm. Had they done their duty to this nation and to the law and to justice, there is not a shadow of a doubt President Reagan would have been impeached and George Bush would have been impeached. Even now, there's a possibility if George Bush doesn't win the presidency that he could wind up in jail. Because if he gets someone, if there's no Ed Meese in there protecting their agenda, uh, then, you know, if you put in a real attorney general who started encouraging the attorneys to pursue these things, uh, you bet you're going to wind up with some prosecutions. I think Dukakis will, will go to great lengths to avoid going for the juggler. They do not want to lose the people's credibility, they the Democrats, mm -hmm. they Dukakis, mm -hmm. to lose the people's trust in the way they would if they brought out the whole truth and impeached Reagan and jailed George Bush. And I assume that uh, you're a Dukakis supporter instead of, of uh, the wimp, right? Oh, We're still Jackson. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a Jackson supporter at this point, and uh, I will probably vote this time uh, for Dukakis uh, against Bush. I did not vote for Mondale. I could not vote for him because he advocated arms and he advocated the Contra program in Central America and for whatever it was worth, I could not vote for him. Uh, what Dukakis does vis-a-vis -vis Jackson and our agenda, what I call the NPR listeners in this country, the people who think and read and study. The alternative views watch. The alternative yeah. views, much better, absolutely. Now, these, these people in this country are represented most closely by Jackson. And, and if Dukakis spurns us and puts in uh, uh, Senator Benson as a running mate or someone yet more conservative and chops us off, then there's going to be a decision time. What will Jackson do? Will he play ball this time and stick with the Democratic Party? Or would he perhaps split off next time around and, and launch a third party? Even which this time. Even this time. Even this time. Now, he obviously couldn't get it going this time in, in time enough to have a major impact. Mm -hmm. But, see, the, the Democratic Party, there's nothing democratic about our system, or very little. I mean, they teach us this in school. We talk about democracy all the time. But even back in grade school, remember where they told you we don't, you know, it's a republic. You know, we, we vote for electors who select the president. And the two parties control 95% of the, of the votes and of the election process. And they've structured the laws to make sure that they control it. Now, you do have primaries which sort out the candidates. But you also have on the Democratic side, for example, the 600-odd superdelegates. Who are, not, who are not voted by anyone. They're just party hacks. They have no more claim 
to, to popular, to democratic, you know, vote. Nobody's voted for them. They, they have no more claim to represent the people than do the party hacks in the Soviet Union who go in there and vote. They come from a region. They're the head of the party unit in that region, so they get a vote. And that's a big block. That's 600 votes. If that, you know, if it were broken down to one person, one vote in the, in the primary system, instead of the fact, what is it, 600 to one, the impact of votes in Texas, depending on whether you come from the wrong part of Houston or a rich ranching county in, in another part of Texas, your vote in the primaries has that much difference in clout, in effect, in impact. How is that? Can you explain that? Yeah, because, because of the, this is what Jackson was challenging and railing about in 1984, was the fact that the votes are not allocated fairly. He was trying to get a redistrict, redist it's the old gerrymandering thing. The system has been rigged very carefully to make sure that the right parts of town have the most impact. They get more delegates. For oh, the 60 votes and in a wealthy part of town will equal one delegate. 6,000 votes on the wrong side of town will equal one delegate. And that's across the nation. Now, Jackson has cooled it on this issue in 1988. In 1984, he was pounding away on this issue. Get the votes distributed fairly and see what a difference it would make. He still raises this from time to time, as well as this superdelegate issue. Had the, uh, the electoral or the delegate count been closer between Jackson and Dukakis, had they gone in even, or even with Jackson mm -hmm. ahead, the superdelegates would have easily taken it to Dukakis right. because uh, they're the establishment. They're the establishment. And well, just See, think. this is why Pat Schroeder decided not to run before. She said the system didn't permit her to run. And this is what she was talking about. She'd been traveling from state to state, meeting with the party machinery. And the party machinery was saying, no, there's not any chance on the face of the earth that we will support you. We've made that decision. And so she came to the conclusion, and then she was assessing how much money she could raise. She could raise a little money, but not enough to overpower the party and make the party accept her. So she had to decide not to run a business decision. Well, who knows? If Jackson had been president, you might have been the next head of the CIA. No way. And you could have shut it down. And we could no. come to Washington and <laughs> be your deputy. <laughs> what I sincerely yeah. hope uh, will come out of this, if Dukakis mm -hmm. does not include Jackson as vice president, mm -hmm. is that Jackson will pull out and give us another party. They're estimating by the turn of the century, one third of every citizen of this country will be of the so-called minorities. Mm -hmm. If you take that and their interests, add it in to their perceptions, add it in to the, the alternative views watchers, the NPR listeners, uh, we might very well come up with a party that would be strong enough to reverse the system, the system itself, to make a major impact on the whole structure of U.S. political society. And that concludes this edition of Alternative Views. We're glad you could join us again. We would like to thank our crew. Brian Lynch set up the studio, the lights, the audio, and also did the directing. Our camera people were Christy Bartlett and Scott Lassman. And of course, we also would like to thank ACTV, Austin Community Television, for the use of their equipment and particularly the use of their mini-studio on this occasion. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. We get a lot of people writing to us from different places around the country where Alternative Views is shown. So if you'd like to drop us a line, please do. We'd be glad to hear from you. Goodbye. <laughs>